What is going on, you guys? Welcome back to Down to the Wire. I'm Brian Costa. And I'm Tyler Tucker. And we have a great show in store for you guys today. Uh, you know, obviously, if you heard, just heard the intro right there, Tyler Tucker, you know, the the second the second wing of this show is back on for the first time. And it's been a minute, but Tyler, we're so glad to have you back on. How are you doing today, man? I'm doing great. You know, first day of class yesterday, uh, getting back into the swing of things. I'm doing good. Yeah. Uh, all in all, how was your summer, man? It was solid, you know. I think I worked a little too much, but I mean, it was a <laughs> lot of fun. You played a lot of golf, so it was fun. Yeah, I mean, it was a lot of fun. I know we crossed paths a good number of times. It was, uh, you know, actually, actually a couple times, which was really good. Got to see you out on Martha's Vineyard. Got to go to a Sox game together, which was really good. When they didn't suck. Yeah, that, uh, <laughs> you know, I don't know. I actually don't know if we'll be talking about that too much today. But uh, yeah, that's that that has been a complete you know, storyline of its own back when, you know, obviously back when they didn't suck, you know, while the game wasn't going in our favor there, but you know, yeah, you know, all in all though, it, it's been a pretty solid summer. Unfortunately, it is kind of coming down to, uh, unfortunately it is kind of really starting to wind down, which is unfortunate. Uh, but you know, obviously this has been a crazy bunch of sports news as we do go back into the fall, the, uh, you know, you know, while the warm weather and all the crazy and all the nice things that come with that will be, uh, you know, unfortunately starting to fade away sooner rather than later. Uh, the, the positive that comes back in is there's a whole bunch of sports to talk about. And that's what I'm really excited to get into with you today. And with that being said, we start off in the NFL and we start off with uh, at least my favorite team. I know, I know you got the Vikings in the background. You got Dalvin uh, repping that. Sir. Uh, yeah, I actually, he was my pick in fantasy football this year. So I will give uh, I, I will shout that out. Hopefully he helps me in this year, but we start off in new England where, uh, you know, there was a bit of a misunderstanding is the way we've been told uh, very recently. Uh, Cam Newton, the uh, it looks like he's going to be the starting quarterback for the Patriots. You know, I knock on wood. I, I'd like to see Mac Jones. But at this point in time, it looks like Cam Newton's going to be the starter. He actually just missed some time was today was actually his first day back at practice. Uh, after he missed some time after being out with uh, COVID-19, he apparently was going to go to a doctor's appointment away from team facilities. It was approved by everyone. He said he was going to get tested on the way there. And apparently through some misunderstanding as the, as the way the Patriots phrased it, he, you know, some, he's technically broke NFL protocols and was forced to isolate for five days. He's now back at practice now, but uh, you know, it's caused this, you know, huge kind of uproar. Uh, I'll let you kind of, you know, maybe start with your kind of first little thoughts on that, on it. Yeah, I mean, I was kind of shocked when I heard that Cam is going to be the day one starter, you know, I was especially with uh, Mac Jones's performance lately. And and I know it's the Giants, you know, anyone could go out there and play as well as he did against them. But um, I, I, I was a little surprised, but I think I think the problem comes with Cam. He's just he's too held on to that starting role at the moment. He's not. I don't think he's he's he hasn't reached the point in his career where he's ready to be like, all right, I'll be the veteran mentor. I'll take half the snaps. I'll I'll kind of coach this guy. He's still like, nah, I'm I'm that guy. I want to go out there, start week one. And I mean, listen, I get that he is technically I know it's kind of a QB competition at this point. I don't think Bill Belichick really thinks of it too much as a QB competition. I think, you know, if you had to if you had to put a lie detector test on Bill Belichick, I'd have to, you know, sincerely believe that 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 man is, I don't think he's going to be rolling with a rookie quarterback out the gate. If he does, then, you know, everything I know about Bill Belichick and his philosophy is completely gone out the window. But even with the performance Cam had last season, I think he is going to be the day one starter for the Patriots. And, you know, while while this did, uh, however, you know, I will say this, this did kind of open up a bit of a window for me because you saw him miss this time. And apparently Mac Jones got a lot of time with the, uh, with you know, the first team and he got to, you know, really work with that offense and, you know, got to, you know, go against like the top guys and you got to see him, you know, in that really good competition, but going off of that, you know, you know, he was able to, you know, have some success. Apparently, you know, he was reported to have shined in practice, which I'm, you know, really glad to hear about, but then cam comes back. It's, and it's kind of business as usual. I kind of took me back a bit. Cause I, there were some reports that new England was frustrated with him. So, you know, how do, how do you feel about this? Do you think that, you know, do you think that Mac is getting a fair shot in this QB competition or do you think that Bill, you know, is kind of leaning the way that I think? I mean, I, I, I think I agree with you. It's, it's Mac, it's Mac Jones's job to win, you know, Cam Newton as again, as regardless of his performance last season, he's still like the day, the week one, he's going to start week one. Yeah. I think Mac Jones needs to show that he can, you know, perform, to or better than the level that uh, Cam Newton has in the past. Cause we don't know, you know, he could, 
trot out there and throw three picks and we'll never see him again, you know? But um, uh, one, one report I saw was when they were uh, doing first team practice versus the Giants, Mac Jones went, I think, 21 for 23 and completed 11 straight. So it's, it's going to be interesting to watch it play out. But I think um, you definitely – you roll with Cam Newton. I mean, think it, think of Mac Jones' perspective. You come out there week one, you are the starting quarterback for the New England Patriots. Like, whose shoes are you trying to fill? You're you're basically trying to you're standing in Tom Brady's shadow. You know, not yeah. many people are gonna are gonna do too well, especially in their rookie season. So, I understand the decision to go with Cam. No, I'm I, I understand, and I don't think anything's officially you know been set in stone. I think that they still are trying to you know, pin it as a QB competition. I know Cam did get the first team reps today and, you know, it, what there was no really split action with it. He was like the, I guess, reportedly was, uh was, you know, the number one guy in seven on sevens and 11 on 11s, which, you know, kind of was surprising, but, you know, and while I, I would like to see the rookie, I can understand where you, where you go with the veteran experience and go with all that, but, you know, it was a little disappointing, but, uh, you know, a, a bigger question that's kind of been raised off of this uh, with the whole Cam Newton missing time, well, you know, it looks like New England kind of dodged a bullet, especially with it happening this early in the season. Uh, from what we know so far, I believe Cam Newton is on, is an unva- is uh, unvaccinated against COVID. And I, I guess if he had been, this would have been a this would have been a situation he wouldn't have had to deal with. Now, in a training camp preseason thing, five days is like, all right, you missed five days. You put a red non-contact jersey on someone in some instances, and like they're good to go. But if you miss five days during the regular season, you're not you're you know more times than not, you're not playing that Sunday. So, yeah, I mean, you get one day off that Monday or depending on when you have your game and then you you go all week. So, yeah. So even if you have a Thursday game, like, you know, that, that, that accelerates the clock even so much more. So, you know, is this something that, you know, I I don't, I don't really want, you know, I'm not going to get into like the, you know, the specifics behind the vaccine and everything like that. That's not, that's not what this show is about. Trust me. But, uh, (laughs) You know, going off that, is this something that you think the Patriots should be, should be concerned about if their availability of their quarterback, you know, can be in doubt like this? I mean, this is this has got to be all on Cam. You know, everything is going to be it's his decision. And, you know, if if he ends up missing more time, which I don't think he will, this kind of seems like it was just like a general just, oh, I didn't even know that was, you know, that was even yeah. a rule at this point. So I don't foresee it being a problem, but. If it does become a problem, then, I mean, the Patriots, they still got another guy. They can just send him away and sign someone else and uh, that's probably sitting waiting for their chance. So it's, it's all on Cam to just step up and, you know, be responsible because he's, he's got a big role to fill. Yeah, and I will reiterate that, you know, I did see on ESPN before the show started, I guess Bill Belichick did come out and he did say, and he did say Cam didn't violate anything team-wise. This was a misunderstanding. This was kind of more on us than anything and, you know, kind of tried to shadow it that way. I So that is good that it, at least it looks like that's the case there. I know it's not the case uh, in some other areas where I guess, uh you know, there have been some other, you know, places where there have been, uh, you know, some situations like this, you know, Buffalo has kind of been uh, another big hotspot for it where uh, Cole Beasley, who's been, you know, vehemently uh, about vehemently against uh, getting vaccinated has, you know, said that he's not going to, uh, he's, I guess, I don't know if he's tested positive, but he at least was labeled as a close contact and was, and is now forced to quarantine and undergo all those processes. I don't know if, and, you know, I guess, you know, also if you're vaccinated, you don't have to do all that stuff. So, you know, is this something that, you know, in general, other, other teams may have to worry about. Yeah. I mean, it's gonna, it's gonna still be an issue, you know, just and granted not to the scale it was last year, but I mean, it, it's still, you know, for the people who decide and that's their right to, to 100%. either do or do not, you know, the, the ones that do not, like you still got a job to do. So you got to be careful. You got to lock yourself in that bubble, you know, uh, yeah. you're, you got to perform for this team. You're getting paid a lot of money. You just got to be responsible, got to be safe. And of course you can't, can't avoid everything, you know, but 100%. just be accountable and, and make sure you can show up and fight for your team every week. That's what I think. hundred percent. And, you know, listen, I, I completely agree that these guys have the freedom to do what they want and they are able to do that. I was hearing something though on the radio and, you know, while I, while, you know, while I wouldn't want it to come down to something like this. You know, I think, you know, with the pressure the NFL is under and while, you know, if I, if I could do things differently, I would, but if an NFL team is, it comes down to cut day and one, and, you know, it's like two guys at the same position, like, you know, you know, 
roster spot number 52 and 53. I was listening to this on a radio show in the car right in. And, you know, one guy's vaccinated, one guy's not. And, you know, equal talent type of thing is, does that almost kind of become, you know, kind of a, you know, another thing to add to, you know, a player's kind of profile saying like, all right, you know, if this guy comes in contact, we at least can, you know, we can at least assure that he's going to be there on that he's going to be there on Sunday, you know, and, you know, we're not going to have a Kendall Hinton situation with the Denver Broncos where we're starting with a, a converted wide receiver at our quarterback spot. You know, is that something that now becomes a possibility? I think that it can, I think that it will definitely become a factor. I think maybe, you know, some areas will, you know, will blatantly say, you know, this isn't what we're about. We're about getting the best possible talent on the team. But if the talent is really indistinguishable and that becomes the only like real difference, I think it could become, you know, something I think it really could become a, uh, a legitimate thing. Yeah, for sure. And you, and you don't want it to come down to that. Like, but no, absolutely. Not. I, I I definitely think that it's something teams are going to take into account now because, you know, you got that, you got that safety net. It's like, all right, we don't have to worry if you're going to be able to play next week, you know, you're just going to be able to play. So yeah. Yeah. I totally agree. I, I mean, listen, I, I don't want it to come down to that either, but another thing I was hearing too, is like, you know, say you're an unvaccinated player and you get cut. If you get picked up by a team, you know, you know, and typically like most guys, it's like, all right, we're going to make a late season pickup and pick up uh, this tight end because, you know, one of our guys went down and we need some, uh, we need to bolster our offense a little bit. We're going to pick this guy up and, you know, he, hopefully he'll be ready to go by Sunday. If you pick that guy up in the middle of the week, he won't be able to go that week because he has to, you know, go through all the quarantine protocols and everything like that, which it's tough. I really don't want to be doing this stuff, but unfortunately that is just the way the NFL is running stuff this season. So, you know, you know, it you know, if you're an unvaccinated player and you get cut, it could be, you know, some time, you know, before you, you know, legitimately get a shot this season. Yeah, for sure. You know? and, and teams might not even want to bother. They might just want to be like, you know, we, we want someone that can come in and start learning our playbook tomorrow. So sorry, we're going to pass on you. Yeah. Which, you know, again, I'm not the biggest fan of this, but I, it, it is something that I definitely want to, you know, bring up. And, you know, I think it's a very interesting situation. Uh, but, you know, also going off that, you know, I want to go back a little bit to the New England situation. You know, there is there's been the whole dynamic of is it going to be Cam or is it going to be Cam or Mac or Mac or Cam? And I think Marcus Spears came out and he ended up saying Cam and Mac is, you know, and he put a greater than sign is greater than Cam or Mac. And basically what he was going off with that is saying, you know, maybe New England could run a similar situation, could run a similar offense to what the Saints did with uh, Taysom Hill and Drew Brees, where you bring in Taysom for, you know, some, you know, running schemes and you use them, you know, on, on an offensive set. Now, well, I don't think Cam Newton would we be using him at running back and a tight end, you know, maybe in some goal line packages in certain situations, if, you know, Mac does overtake him as the pure starter, maybe you roll him out in that, in that type of package. What do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, it's totally plausible. And, and don't forget the Saints, too. They threw Jameis Winston in the mix, too. So yeah. they really had that that three-team going. Um, it's a three-headed monster. Exactly. But uh, I... <laughs> I don't know. The, the only the only problem with that scenario for me is, you know, you had Drew Brees, who was, you know, you know, he could throw the ball and throw the ball well, but he couldn't move. And then yeah. and then you had Taysom Hill, who was just an animal. And yeah. I think Cam Newton, Cam Newton, he doesn't have the probably the same psychotic tendencies as Taysom Hill, but he can <laughs> he can move like he does. And he he could probably catch like he does. I would just assume. honestly, I wouldn't doubt it. Yeah. So I think. The problem there is, like, in this situation, I'd, I'd put Mac Jones in more of the Drew Brees role and then Cam yeah. Newton in more like the, oh, it's third and long, but we want to run a read option. You know, we could we could toss Cam in there. But then, you know, first and 10, we want to we want to throw a couple, as I call it, Edelman crossing routes over the middle. You know, I'm, I'm, spot, uh, I'm putting Mac Jones in there because I don't trust Cam to throw it more than seven yards down the middle of the field. Honestly. Yeah. I mean, didn't, didn't Cam Newton catch a, I, I don't know if it was a two, I don't know if it's a two point conversion or a touchdown pass, but didn't he catch, didn't he make a catch in the end zone last year? I think he did. Yeah. Yeah. I think he did. It was a like week 17 against the jets. So, I mean, obviously it's week 17 against the jets. No one really cares, yeah. but, uh, but I, but he did do it. So, I mean, you know, that is something uh, to definitely look at. Maybe you can use them. You know, I don't know. I don't know, think you're going to be throwing Cam out wide, but, you know, even if you use him down low in those uh, goal line packages where you just set him up and have him run it in, you know, you know, I, you know, he did come up short in those Seattle games, but he also did ha just have some games where you, it was just, you know, a design direct snap. He had no wide receivers and they were just like, all right, Cam, just plow this thing in, just get yeah. us the touchdown. And it worked a number of times because, you know, you know, everyone kind of sees Cam Newton that he, and, you know, you know, he's a mobile guy. But I don't think enough people, you know, really know exactly how quick he is. He's, you know, he's 
you know, while, while a lot of people go, yeah, of course he's quick. He's quicker than you think though. It's actually crazy. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And, and I mean, what's the sense in making a competition when you have, you have two good quarterbacks with very different skill sets, just utilize them, you know? Yeah. I mean, I, I hope that Bill Belichick will, you know, use some creativity with it. Cause you know, I, I mean, listen, I don't think we're getting Brian Hoyer into this mix, but uh, no, 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 no. Hoyer can, uh, Hoyer can enjoy that bench spot or even, you know, the practice squad for all I care. But, you know, I think that, you know, utilizing these two guys like this, it has, you know, a bunch of benefits to it. Yeah, I totally agree. I, I think rather than have them compete for the starting job, you know, just split the snaps, game time scenarios, case by case, you know, you, you got to run the ball, take Cam, you got to throw it, take Max, something like that. I think that would be a lot better than just having those two fight over the start, starting role. I agree. And I think that doing it as well will lead to, uh, I think doing it as well will eventually lead Bill Belichick to, you know, lean in one direction or the other, and it will probably, you know, open some eyes for him to say, all right, who do I trust in more situations? For sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Going off that, uh, you know, speaking, you know, we kind of talked about this uh, idea of a dual QB, you know, system and offense based on the idea behind the saints and their, and their, the way they ran their QBs, you know, for years down there, uh, you know, you know, now going over to the saints, uh, you know, we looked, you know, I was kind of, you know, going back and forth, looking at their preseason game with Jameis Winston and Daysom Hill, because now the breeze is out there that is out of there. Now they were having a quarterback competition themselves to see who will be the heir apparent, you know, while Taysom Hill did start, I believe it was four games or five or so games during last year's regular season. I think he went four and one, or, you know, even four and oh, and or I, you know, don't remember the specifics of it, but he had a winning record, uh, you know, but looking so far at this preseason, Taysom Hill has been fine. But the thing that has surprised me so so far has been Jameis Winston's in, in completely, you know, out of the blue. He's been amazing. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, he's really stepped up to the plate. And like I, I think Breeze even said something on his way out to Jameis. He was like, This is your team now. And I yeah. think that really stuck with him because he has stepped up to the plate. And I think uh I was looking at pro football focus, you know, how they were doing grades at like preseason quarterbacks, and he was like 90 plus I, I was really surprised to see that yeah I mean I I'm really excited about it I think that you know I, I thought you know when here's the thing when when Jameis le- when Jameis Winston left the box I thought he was done and when I thought the Saints you know extended that to him I thought it was kind of just like uh like oh here's a lifeline you know you can maybe rebuild yourself here and you know you know maybe if you prove yourself as a backup similar to what Teddy Bridgewater did. I know that he eventually got some starts and got some action like that, but I thought it was a similar situation to that where, where it's like, all right, we'll give you a lifeline, come in here, back up, and maybe some other team will give you a shot down the line. Now seeing what he's doing for them, it has completely changed my perspective. James Winston looks incredible. I mean, the way he's actually able to, fl- he's actually able to fling it now. I mean, I can't believe it. I mean, I, I remember talking about it. I think it was on the second show that I, that we ever did. I think that you and Carter were out uh, on a band trip, but I was talking about it at the time and, you know, it had just come out that Jameis Winston got LASIK surgery and was, you know, you know, been, you know, it, you know, was, uh, it came to our knowledge that for the longest time he was throwing blind, which, you know, was crazy to me because, you know, he was still, he was able to still able to throw 30 touchdowns also through 30 picks, 30 interceptions, but, you know, you know, it's a very, that's a very impressive stat, but you know, one's more than the other, unfortunately. But when it came out that he actually, you know, wasn't really able to see that well. And then you saw like the little glimpses of him in between, it was actually kind of a, you know, you were seeing a little bit of a different guy there. And it was like, wow, like this guy, she could be something. And from the glimpses we've seen so far this preseason, if this is the James Winston, the saints have, they may have a more dynamic offense than they had last year. Yeah. And, and one thing that really sticks out for me too, he looks more disciplined. You know, I was I was watching a couple of videos and he was standing in the pocket a little more. He wasn't taking off real quick and his throwing motion, too. I don't know. It, it, it looks slightly improved to me. It looks like he's using more of his body and coming, you know, more over the top like he should. So, yeah, I, I'm excited to see what they do. As much as I love Taysom Hill and watching him run through anybody that's in his way, I, you need a guy that can throw throw the ball better than him, you know? Yeah. And, you know, everything granted to Taysom Hill. I think that, you know, as an, as an NFL player, he is a once in a lifetime kind of just, you know, he, he's amazing at what he does. He is literally a human Swiss army knife and you can't take that away from him for what he does. Yeah. But, uh, but when you look at the saints and you, and you get, and you get Jameis Winston in there and you, if you get the Jameis Winston that you've been seeing this preseason, 
and then you have Taysom Hill back in his role. That isn't, that's obviously an amazing thing for the offense. The other thing that I think will be uh, interesting to see is, you know, whenever Mike Thomas does return and, you know, hopefully it's sooner rather than later, you know, while you were saying that Drew Brees was a great throw of the football and for many years he was, I think, you know, during the latter years of his career, that arm, you know, unfortunately was starting to fade and, you know, the, you weren't getting as many deep balls as you wanted. I, you know, and I think unfortunately that kind of, you know, while we, while, while we see Mike Thomas as this, uh, as this incredible receiver, which he is, you know, we were really, we were really never able to utilize him as a deep ball threat, which I think that, which I think the saints actually will be able to do this year for, you know, finally for the first time in a while, because, you know, you could get him in some certain situations. You're finally gonna be able to really utilize him downfield, which, you know, could be lethal. Yeah. I mean, even if I forget which playoff game it was uh, last year for the saints, but they brought Jameis in, to th- or was it Taysom? Either Jameis or Taysom to throw that deep ball down. It was Jameis. It was Jameis. Yeah. So I, I, I'm excited. You know, I, I've al- I've always thought that it wasn't really Michael Thomas restricting himself to five yard slants. It was Drew Brees' arm. So it'll be interesting to see what he could do. We can ex- actually go deep and create some separation. But I think one thing. Um, who who else is there for wide receivers on the team? I mean, you can really. Every night, he's going to be seeing the best guy on the other side of the ball. So it'll be really interesting to see. Yeah, I mean, that's very true. I mean, like the the Saints, there is like some undrafted guy that I guess has really been making a name for himself. I'm not too sure of his name. I think it's like Marquez, but I'd have to go look into it. But he's actually been, you know, kind of a superstar so far. He's uh, like, I, I don't know if you've been seeing this guy, but he's really just been showing out really really like he well if you see the uh if you look back on the highlight of uh of of the uh of the of like the uh winston you know hail mary kind of play to the end zone that was the guy who ended up catching it oh okay gotcha uh but you wanted to think of uh of offensive guys that the uh that the saints have i i forgot to mention this i think i mentioned this a while back but uh you know this will be a name that kind of jogs from memory. chris hogan is one of the wide receivers currently on the saints right now wow that's a name uh, Chris Hogan, Ty Montgomery, obviously, who kind of came to fame with the Packers is there. He's kind of being used more as a running back now in these days, but has some wide receiving experience. Uh, but you know, all around though, I do agree with you. It, once, uh, once Mike Thomas gets back, he is going to be, uh, facing the best competition. So, you know, however they try to utilize him downfield, I'll, I'll be excited to see it. Yeah, for sure. Uh, you know, going back to the Patriots, I forgot to mention this at, before we transition over the Saints, but I but I think, you know, going off the two QB situation, it was fitting. Uh, you know, the Patriots actually just made a actually made a big trade just the other day. Uh, really surprised me. But, you know, all in all, I'm actually kind of excited about excited by this move. Uh, it recently it recently came out that the Patriots are trading uh, running back Sony Michelle to the L.A. Rams for a fourth round pick in 2023 and a sixth round pick in 2022. I'm actually pretty excited about this move. I'll I'll let I'll let you kind of start off with it and give your thoughts, but I'm actually pretty excited about this move. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, good for Sony. He's going to he's going to a good spot. He's probably going to split carries with uh Cam Akers, but I mean, it's going to be a really good fit for him. I I'm really scared of the Rams this year. I mean, I I've been watching Matt Stafford just pull off the impossible for I don't know how long at this point and for the people that haven't watched him as, as much as, you know, I've seen him twice a year, every single year. And I, let me tell you that dude can ball. So it's, it's going to be a fun team to watch. And uh, I think the Patriots got a, a lot out of him, which I didn't expect that much of a return for him. So good for them on their end. And uh, Sony's going to have a great opportunity in LA. Yeah. I mean, I'll say this to Sony for what he did for us, you know, early on in his career and especially just his rookie season, which, you know, at the beginning of the year, you know, he had some knee injuries and he had some problems with that. But, you know, come the playoffs, what he did for us there was incredible. You know, you know, I think about that Chargers game where he just absolutely went off. I think about the Super Bowl touchdown that he had that, you know, basically sealed the deal. And, you know, while things kind of unfortunately went downhill after that, uh, you know, I'm still very thankful for him when, you know, I don't know what exactly happened to him, but, you know, his rookie season, whenever he ran, he ran like he was ready to run through a brick wall. And, you know, it looked like nothing was ever able, like nothing was ever going to stop him. Later on, though, I don't know what it was. Every time he got the ball, it kind of looked like he was a little more upright with it. Like he, you know, wanted to like survey the field and see what was happening more, almost as if he was afraid of like getting hit. I don't think that's necessarily the case, but that's just how it looked to me. And, you know, it just, it, he didn't look like the same guy. And, you know, while I hope that, while I wish him the best in LA, I think this is a great opportunity for us to, you know, 
you know, we have a ton of running backs. We have a, we have a great number of depth with guys like James White, uh, Rex Burkhead, who I actually is Rex coming back. I'm not too sure, but you know, even if he isn't, you know, we have great depth beyond that. And what I think this opens up is what I, you know, the, the great opportunity that I think op- this opens up for us is uh, the, is, you know, the debut of, uh, I believe it was fourth round draft pick and running back Ramondre Stevenson. Uh, he's a running back out of Oklahoma. And if uh, Tyler, I don't know if you've been watching too many Patriots preseason games, but this guy is an absolute workhorse. I love this guy. He looks like the second coming of LeGarrette Blunt, and he has, and he's much faster than him too. He is wow. a freak. I mean, he, he ripped off like a 96 yard touchdown in the first preseason preseason game. He had like, I think two or something touchdowns in the second one. He is going to be our, our power back this year. And he looks amazing. I saw like from the second I saw the film on this guy, I was like, this guy is going to be something like, I remember when I saw like footage on James white, I was kind of like, ah, like I could see how they utilize him and they utilize and they kind of maybe use him in like a Shane Vereen role. And obviously that worked out great for us. I think Ramondre Stevenson could be a, huge day one starter for the Patriots and it could be a you know it could be a game changer you know what I mean Bill Belichick he he's got that system never pay your running backs and he always seems to have two or three good ones so I don't know it seems to be working so some bold claims out of you and I, I like it I can't wait to see him week one watch out for Ramondre Stevenson I will say that you know besides that though I think the Patriots also have a great number of other running backs I mean you know, even with Sony out the door, I, I think we have, uh, you know, I'll pull up the roster right now, but I know we have James White. Uh, yeah, here it is. We have we have Brandon Bolden, obviously more of kind of a special teamer. We have Damian Harris, who's still a great power back as well. Stevenson, J.J. Taylor, who is great. And James White, all, you know, our backfield, I was saying it all of last year. If, you know, we have we had tremendous you know depth at our backfield, but it was our wide receivers and our tight ends that were killing us. You know, now that we have that help. I'm really excited to see where this offense goes going forward. Yeah, I mean, you stacked up on tight ends for sure. I mean, that was probably the two best tight ends on the market, arguably, and you got them both, so. But, yeah, no, I agree with you there. I think that it could be a huge addition for us, and I'm really excited to see this offense. Uh, the final thing I want to touch on in NFL news is, uh, you know, I, I guess there are some reports coming out about Lamar Jackson and, you know, how he's going to do coming into the season. And, you know, some people on ESPN, I guess there are some scouts and some NFL officials saying that uh, there are some people saying, oh, we figured out how to play Lamar Jackson. We know how to play this guy. He's kind of a one dimensional guy because it's more pass than th- it's more, you know, actually the exact opposite, more run than pass. I'm usually, you know, you know, with quarterbacks, you want to say the opposite, but they're saying he's just like this mobile guy who, you know, only passes out of necessity and, you know, just, you know, they, they think they have him figured out. I don't necessarily think that the teams have him figured out. But, uh, you know, how do you feel about this? I mean, I don't I don't agree with that at all. I mean, no. I think we've heard this before. I mean, I think the couple of seasons, the last couple of seasons, they've been like, oh, we got Lamar down pet. Listen, the only way you stop Lamar Jackson is if you get a middle linebacker that's built like a wide receiver and then put him in to just spy on him the entire game. Yeah. I mean, if you if you full out blitz him, you know, he can still he, he has the ability to throw the ball like he can't he, he can make the motion and he can make passes to his wide receivers like, yeah, I, I don't agree with that take at all. I, I, I don't I don't think that's I think that's far from the truth. I, I agree with you there. And while I do think and while I do think that, you know, obviously, while Lamar is in Peyton Manning uh, <laughs> by a, by a long stretch. You know, I have I have seen improvement in the way he's been throwing. Now, while I, you know, you do see some clips at a training camp where he throws the ball and it, you know, kind of almost looks like a Tim Tebow training camp throw where the thing like barely gets out of his hand. And you see a couple of those, you know, he does have he is able to, you know, actually have some good throws in the uh, regular season. So I will give him that, you know, the only thing that is going to hold up Lamar and, you know, going down the stretch is his durability and his legs, because, you know, that that is really the only thing it's you know if Lamar has a, if Lamar has a Robert Griffin-esque leg injury how will that impact him going forward and I think that's a I think it's a legitimate question I hope that that, that something like that doesn't ever happen to him and he can keep doing this for as long as he can but I think eventually he is going to have to learn to you know well I think being mobile will always be part of his game he's never going to be a traditional step back and you know drop back quarterback he's eventually going to have to learn to do a little bit more of that as he gets older yeah for sure and but I, I think it can be done one way or the, the other. You know, you've seen guys with no mobility be able to get it done, and you've seen guys that are almost all mobility get it done. So I, I think 
I don't think they figured out Lamar Jackson and I, I think he'll be around unless, you know, God forbid we see a, we see a grotesque leg injury out of him. And then, you know, that could, that could throw a kink. 100% it could throw a kink in and everything like that, but I don't anticipate that coming this season again, knock on wood, best of luck to Lamar this year. I hope that him and the Ravens have great success against every team, but the Patriots, but uh, going forward, I want to jump into NBA news where, uh, you know, this always seems like an ongoing feud that will never die, but the, the feud between the 2008 Celtics and the teammates that, and the teammates with them, it never seems like it's it somehow this team has lived on in, in infamy, a team that, you know, a team that only and a dynasty that only won one championship is, you know, still relished as, you know, one of the most dynamic dynasties in NBA history. Well, it pisses me off that they couldn't have won more. Uh, you know, I have a tremendous respect for the 2008 team. I love what they were able to bring the city of Boston, but God damn it, man. Like the heat that still goes on between them is ridiculous. So I was seeing something going on. My brother actually pointed this out to me. I don't think this garnered any major attention, but uh, you know, there was a Celtics fan page that, you know, kind of just posted a pic of, I believe it was of Rondo Garnett, Ray Allen and uh, KG. And they were all kind of just in like a, you know, a photo op with each other, probably at some presser event, maybe, you know, like the ESPYs or something. I don't remember the exact specifics of it. And he just posted all of it, tagged all the guys and and just said like, oh, the good times and something like that. And Kevin Garnett ended up taking that picture. He put it on his Instagram story, but he decided to zoom in to block out Ray Allen and only had, and only had the, and only had the three guys. Wow. That is petty if i've ever seen it <laughs> it's so petty because listen i it wasn't like an espn thing it was like some random celtics fan page and it's like it's like all right like you don't even need to acknowledge these guys you could have even you could have even just liked the photo or done something like that or you know just like randomly posted the photo but and it's such an and it looks and it it literally looks like it doesn't even take that much effort but the fact that you can actually tell that he zoomed in enough to block out ray allen just shows like how just how much this beef has gone on to this day. It's incredible. I mean, I, I, it still blows my mind that they're still pissed off about this to this day, but it just, yeah, it I just mean, goes to, it's it goes impressive. To I mean, even Rondo too. I mean, he, he, they're still all fiery about it. And, but you know what? I think it shows from their personalities the type of players they were. I mean, Kevin Garnett, you can't find any more players with more fire than him. And, you know, he, yeah. he's, he's definitely the type of guy to hold on to something like that. But yeah, the levels of petty are very impressive. No, the levels of petty are off the freaking charts, Tyler. I can't even believe it. It's, it's so bad. And I, listen, you know, the fact that Ray Allen left and he went to the heat, I, I mean, listen, for me, I can I come from a weird place where, you know, I, when I grew up, obviously I was a huge sports fan. It's like, Oh, I like the Red Sox. I like the Patriots. I like the Celtics, I like the Bruins, but I didn't really follow it where I, the way I follow things now, I'd say probably when I first really started following sports was probably around when I was 12, 13 years old, which, you know, for a lot of people seems older, but that was just me. You know, when I was younger, I'd see the stuff on TV. I just would not be as interested. I'd, I'd like Tom Brady, but if, but if I saw him under center, I'd be like, all right, I'm all set. I'm not going to really tune in this game. And that, like, that's, that was just me when I was six years old. I was like, all right, I'm going to go play with my Legos. That was me. <laughs> but, you know, now, the now, you know, kind of getting into an understanding. So I kind of look at it from, you know, a lot of these older Boston sports stories. I kind of look at, look at it from an almost an outsider's perspective. I sometimes feel the pain, but there are some times where I look at it from an outsider's perspective. And when Ray Allen left, like, I, I know that some Boston sports fans were hurt by it. And, and it was like, oh, he's betraying us. He's going to the enemy. And while there is kind of an esque of like, oh, Johnny Damon going to the Yankees. At the same time, you know, both Johnny Damon and Ray Allen, they were never ours to begin with. We didn't draft these guys and bring them up through the system. And like they and like Ray, like Ray Allen wasn't a Celtic since day one. He was a was he like a was he a Milwaukee Buck first or was he a Supersonic yeah. first? Milwaukee yeah, he was, Buck. He was a Milwaukee sure. Buck, and then he was in Seattle, and then he finally came here. So it's like he was never ours to begin with. Like if Paul Pierce did that and then went to the Miami Heat. I'd be like, okay, that's kind of a, that's a real like a hole move. Like, you know, Paul Pierce and while Paul Pierce gets a lot of grief now that would have really put me over the edge for Paul Pierce. I would have been like, dude, screw you. You're literally going to join LeBron, but Ray Allen, that situation. Yeah. Well, it hurt to see him join that team and, you know, do that to us. I mean, you know, he was never ours to begin with. Like we traded for him. We had him for the seasons that we had him. I'm glad that we had him for what he did, but all in all, you know, he made the he made the call. He made his personal call and ended up sinking one of the most uh, consequential shots in NBA Finals history. Yeah, I mean, he he had nothing to prove to Boston. I love Ray Allen. I mean, UConn guy. I love all those old UConn guys. But 
I mean, he, he like he said, you know, it wasn't like a Paul Pierce type situation. He he didn't need to bring home a chip. You know, he he, he did his time. You know, he he got his one, and you know, it, he thought it was time to leave. So that's his prerogative, and he, he went and he he won another one. So yeah, I mean, all the credit to him. I you know, while while I don't like the fact that he helped LeBron do it, you know, he he. You can also the you can also say though that him going to the Heat basically saved LeBron's career. So you know, yeah. So you can almost say that too. But you know, while while it never looks like Ray Allen will ever get his jersey retired by the Boston Celtics, Kevin Garnett will. This was something I remember I reported on on the second show we ever did too. Uh, but obviously due to due to COVID, this this uh, obviously got pushed off. But Kevin Garnett's jersey retirement is officially now on, and it's back on. I think they were planning to do it during the 2021 season, but uh, actually during the 2020-2021 season, but obviously with COVID and no fans in the stands, they were like, why even bother? This is kind of a, like, this wouldn't even be worth it in the celebration. But the Celtics did announce that they are going to be retiring Garnett's jersey on the 13th, and that number five will be waving proudly in the rafters. I'm really excited for that day. I, you know, I'm really glad about that. Yeah, good for him. I mean, if anyone deserves it, it's Kevin Garnett. He's on the list of people. But, I mean, they're going to run out of numbers soon. They're going to yeah. be trying out there with, like, 99s and 98s. So, but, yeah, good get, for him. That's you're awesome. Gonna, you're going to get a pound sign on one dude's jersey, a dollar <laughs> sign. Like, you're going to exactly. get geometry, whatever's. I mean, <laughs> I, I don't even know at this point. But, dude, I, I don't know. Kevin Garnett, man, I, when I think of him, I just, you know, he – he just really reminds me of just like the old times with, with the Celtics. And, you know, it, it's really just a nostalgia trip with him. I mean, I'm looking up here in my wall right now. And if I can actually, you know, actually take this thing down, I'll, uh, I'll try my best, but I have a uh, old ticket from the first Celtics game I ever went to it. You guys won't be able to see it if you're watching this on audio, but it's a Kevin Garnett ticket of, you yeah, know, that's awesome. For first Celtics game I ever went to, we played the Utah jazz. And I just remember that very specifically. And that's, you know, I, I still have that ticket to this day. So, you know, I, that's, that's what I think of when I think of Kevin Garnett, I think of the old time Celtics, you know, my old time Celtics, obviously not, obviously not the Bill Russell Celtics, but I think of, you know, the nostalgia trip Celtics that, you know, I think of, and it's good times. And I, I'm glad that the Celtics will be honoring them. Yeah. I mean, that was the big three. That was honestly for, for our age of sports fans, you know, we didn't know Larry Bird at all. So that was the team that really introduced us to like the Boston Celtics and the winning culture. And uh, to this day, I got, I got a, you can't see it because of my background, but I got a, a Ray Allen and a Kevin Garnett poster sitting on my wall. I got a yeah. jersey sitting in my, uh, sit in my drawers. So, but yeah, good for him. That's great. Yeah. I actually just remember that too. I think I had a Ray Allen shirt back in the day. So like the fact that he's now the villain, it kind of makes me be like, uh, but at the same time I had a Ray Allen shirt. I had a Rondo hoodie. It was just what everyone repped, but you know, I, you know, I, I hope eventually they do kiss and make up. I don't think that'll be for a long time, Tyler, but uh, you know, you know, maybe when these guys are, are old and gray, we'll see them make up. So yeah, I, I'm not, I'm sure. not crossing my fingers, but we'll, you know, we'll have to see what happens there. Yeah. Uh, but you know, you know, that concludes what we actually have in sports news for the show. Uh, you know, there will be some sports stuff to bring up, but, you know, this is what but we're now going to transition to some pop culture things going on uh, in the world right now. Uh, you know, typically when, you know, top, typically with pop culture stuff, we, you know, it'll be like a kind of a one off thing where we talk about something brief and then, you know, it's kind of over with. But, you know, I had some uh, I was able to you know find some topics that I was actually really interested in. And I think Tyler will be as well. Uh, sure. So so I think we dive right into that. Uh, you know, Tyler, the first thing I want to talk with you, you know, this could all change tonight. And, you know, again, I'm not going <laughs> to knock on wood because I'm praying to God that Kanye West finally answers and drops Donda. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but it's not dropping. I, it's I, not dropping. I, I just I can't allow people to get their hopes up. I mean, let's be real with ourselves. You know, he, he we're he's getting a listening us. party for sure that he's going to be two to three hours late to. But yeah. I think, yeah. Uh, last I checked, the the iTunes pre-order date, which of course I pre-ordered it because you gotta. Um, yeah. Expected delivery date was September fifth. Oh, and they that keep, are they been, moving it back again? Oh. Yeah, that has been pushed off ever since about like August eleventh, and then eighteenth, and twenty sixth, and now we're already in September fifth. I mean, who knows? Maybe it'll be a good early Christmas present, but <laughs> I don't think I, I don't have faith in tonight. 
I, I don't have too much faith either. You know, hopefully, uh, hopefully we are proven wrong, but you know, you know, you were talking about the listening party and everything coming through with that. I guess Kanye is currently reconstructing his childhood home in soldier field, which I, I was hearing those reports and I'm just like, of course, that's what he's doing. I mean, of course. And, you know, while, you know, I remember, you know, you know, hearing the original reports about Donda and like he came out with a tweet saying, oh, it's going to drop on this day. And everyone was skeptical and including myself, because I'm just like, you know, it's it's his tweet. Like there's nothing really official backing it. And, you know, with the pre-orders and stuff like that, I, you know, that's there's like kind of an official more kind of thing behind it. You know, I was really convinced after the first listening party, not not because of what he did out there, but seeing the commercials of the Apple Music thing saying, hey, the, the album is dropping tonight. It is dropping tonight. And yeah. I'm just like and I'm just like, all right if Kanye is putting himself in a bind like this, like that's going to be like, it's, it's one thing for him to come out and say, Oh, I'm going to do this. But when he's putting Apple music on and, and they're coming out and saying, Hey, the album's coming, like we're, we're behind this. And then when it doesn't come, you know, I feel like if you're Apple music, you got to be pissed at him. And, but I think they're giving him like more and more listening parties, which really does surprise me. I feel like if I was Apple music, I'd be like, Hey dude, like we kind of, we're kind of putting our, putting ourselves out there for you. And you know, we're hyping this thing up, but you keep on blowing us off with this. Like, what the hell <laughs> yeah i mean I, I think for me too like the pre-orders on top of the listening party and then that commercial with by beats and apple music being is so real and i was like i even i even posted on my story that night i was like you know every year when i go on vacation there's always a classic album coming out and then just boom shot to the heart i remember sitting there on my phone watching that first listening party first hour i was like oh man, this kind of sucks. And then second hour, I was like, oh my God, he's never going to show up. And then finally, after about three hours, I was like, oh, okay, he's here. But I mean, let's be honest. You were, I think you were turned into that first one too. I mean, I'm kind of thankful he's taking his time because there was a couple moments on that first one where I was like, that mix, that mix isn't there yet. That, that, that audio that needs to be just re-recorded. Yeah. I mean, I, I will tell you this. Did you end up listening to the second listening party at all? Uh, yeah, I did. Yeah. And I, from like, you can tell, like there is, there was a drastic, you know, improvement from what he did Leaps and, and, bounds. and, you know, from, you know, I was going back and I was like, you know, listen to snippets of the old one. There is a song, I guess he, they, he's, there's going to be on the album. I think it's called new again. It's going to be with Chris Brown. And, you know, you could actually tell, uh, you know, there's like this weird sample that's playing over right now. I, you know, in the, even in the latest one, I think it's like some weird Michael Jackson sample, but even with it there, but even with it, you know, I was listening back to the Kanye one and, you know, you can kind of hear him just riffing and like, it, it sounds like he's just like trying to fill the, fill the, fill the space. Cause he knows there's going to be a feature there, but he's like, all right, I just have to like, I kind of just have to be like, Oh, this is kind of what I want to do here. So it's kind of like saying like, maybe I know again. Da, 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 da. And like, he's even saying it like that. He's yeah. Literally, he's literally just humming along and, and just saying like, Oh, this is literally filler. And people were like, this is the album like is this like a new style Kanye and yeah. you, that, and then you listen to then you listen to the second party and it was like okay like we understand what's going on here like even in the, even after the second listening party you know a lot more stuff seemed polished and you know I, and pe- people were saying all right, all right the album is done like we are ready for this thing and while I had some feelings of that I also there was also a part of me that even kind of went and eh, there were some tracks where I was like unsure about it like the like uh, I guess he was trying to redo the pop smoke television track and it yeah. was trying to, it was almost trying to do uh I think like like this version's album of don't like like where they took Chief Keef's song and they uh and like Kanye made it his own on uh on on Cruel Summer. Yep. So I think you know if you listen to that song that sounded unpolished there are other there were other things that you know just didn't sound exactly right where you know I think you know you know, it's been what three weeks since the last list listening party. I'll be really excited to see how it sounds this time, but you know, I'm, I'm really excited about it. I, I, I will likely listen to parts of the listening party, probably not all of it, but you know, you know, to hear the improvement go along, I'll be excited for it. Yeah. I mean, during that first, uh, listening party, I know the exact pop smoke song you were talking about and I was listening to it and I was like, Oh man, there's no way Mike Dean and Kanye listened to this and was just like, yeah, let's send this through. And then, but exactly. yeah, you could definitely hear just drastic and huge leaps towards the right direction in the second party. And I know me, I'm going to be tuned into that thing all night long tonight. I cannot wait. You know, I think he's going to do something totally inventive. And I think it'll be a little more, a little more, I don't want to say choreography, but a little more things involved in him kind of just standing there and walking yeah. around so I, i'm really excited 
No, I agree with you too. And what I've been noticing from these parties too is it it looks like the state, it looks like he's, you know, you know, been, you know, kind of like this, he's been the stage has been getting even larger for him as he's been doing it. Like, yep. you know, you look at the first party, he goes out to literally it's just the Falcon Stadium with just a white cloth over the entire field and he's just walking over it in a red suit. And it's like, okay, like he's just doing his own thing. And then it's like the second one, he has like this, he has like kind of more of a like a bed set up and he's like doing everything like that. And now at the third one, he builds like this literal home in the stadium. I'm just like, you know, while I saw the home and everything like that, at the same time, I'm almost like there's also a lot of empty space. So I'm almost wondering, is it Kanye's vision to like keep doing these parties until he literally fills these stadiums with like, you know, his set of what he wants it to look like. And then, you know, once the, once the stage is set, then he releases it. because, And then he says like, this is the story. This is what I want you guys to know. And that's how he does it. That's a, that's just, I, I know nothing. That's something that I think that he'd like to do because uh, I'm thinking back to the life of Pablo. I don't know if you, I don't know if you ever watched the listening party for that when that originally was coming out, but during that listening party, you know, he had this, he had like this giant fashion show, everything crazy going on at Madison square garden. There were like these, you know, drapes and everything like that going crazy inside the stadium. And, you know, you know, the Donda listening parties look a lot more simplistic in comparison. And, yeah. you know, you know, why, I, well, I think that, well, I think that Kanye has gone through this new kind of uh phase of like, you know, finding God and doing everything like that. I, you know, he is still, he still does want to go big time with stuff and does want to do the most to promote his album. So, you know, you know, could it, could it drop tonight? Anything could happen tonight, but let's be real, you know? Yeah. And let, also let's not forget he lifted himself to the heavens in the second listening <laughs> yeah. party that was a lot of fun to watch but that yeah. was ridiculous but you know that concludes what we have in terms of kanye west news which you know always will be ongoing but uh you know also in pop culture something that we me and tyler were talking about before the show was you know i i saw this on rap tv and of course rap tv you know breaks all the weirdest news on the internet i, I swear to god but we ended up seeing that tony hawk is releasing a skateboard line with uh you know that is a, reportedly infused with his own blood. I don't know how to say that any, you know, in a clear context, but yeah, Tony Hawk basically went on a live video and he said, I think he's partnering with uh, Liquid Death. Which I don't exactly know what they are. They're like a, they're, they're, they're some a, sort of, they're a water company. They yeah, make water. Some, yeah. There's <laughs> some sort of water company. I, like, I don't know if it's seltzers or whatever they make, but he goes on with this company and, and he says, all right. And, you know, he gets injected with, he gets injected with a needle, ha, ha, gets, uh, you know, gets his blood drained. And then I literally see they, you literally see them take this vial of his blood. They dump it into a thing of paint. They mix it up and then they make skateboards out of it. I'm like, what the hell is going on? Yeah. I, I saw the same video you were referencing. And as soon as I saw his blood literally get drawn from him, I was like, okay, that's, that's enough for me. Yeah. I, I hate needles. And I'm just like, I'm like, what the hell is this guy doing? And I'm just like, I'm just like, if you were in Tony Hawk's like, you know, PR department and someone comes forward and it goes, Hey man, this, this drink company really wants to do a promotion with you and, you know, design some boards, you know, Tony Hawk's probably like, Oh, perfect. I'm, you know, I'm, you know, in my fifties, I'm doing this, you know, this is a great offer for me. What do I have to do? And they're like, we're going to draw your blood and put it into a board. How does, how does Tony Hawk at this age, I could understand maybe like a 20 something year old Tony Hawk being like, Oh, that's totally cool, man. How does someone at his age just go, yeah, that sounds like a great idea. I'm going to do that. Yeah, I, I think the only explanation is Tony Hawk is just still crazy. He probably yeah. heard that and he's like, yeah, that sounds awesome. <laughs> Let's do it. Yeah. And I know this, I knew this, uh, you know, kind of drew some criticism from the rapper Lil Nas X. He came out and was, and was saying, was saying, oh, you criticize me for making a shoe with blood infused in it, but Tony Hawk's doing it with a skateboard and where's the criticism? Listen, dude, I will give all the criticism. Both ideas are whack. Do not yep. do this. Yeah, I agree. Both are just like, uh, kind like of gross me out. I swear to God, this is like, this has to be the darkest timeline. Why are people so obsessed with this? Like, and if you wanted to think that this didn't go, that if you want to, if you want to lose even more faith in humanity, I guess the boards that they, you know, were selling infused with this blood sold out within like 20 minutes. Yeah, 500 bucks a piece. I'm just like, why? <laughs> why did you want this so badly? Like, it's, yeah. It's just so bad, dude. I'm like, like it's infused with his blood. Like, why? yeah. And and you, you can't like ever ride that. I I don't ever expect people to no. ride that. They're just gonna hang it on their wall. Yeah. And I'm just like, it just seems so grotesque and like awful. I'm like, 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 
like, how do you explain that to a guest if you come over to your house? Oh, what's that skateboard? Oh, it's a, you know, it's, uh, it's a Tony Hawk special edition skateboard. Oh, what special, ed- what's special edition about it? Oh, is bloods in it. Yeah. That, that have, would want, off put a lot you, of people. You want to go have dinner? <laughs> it's like, no, I want to leave. Yeah. It's so ridiculous, man. I, <laughs> I, I saw that story. I was losing my mind. I was like, this is the most ridiculous story I think I've ever seen. I like, I had to like literally refresh the page. I was like, no, no, no. Like raps, like joking. Like, cause like sometimes they will put up like fake posts, but I'm like, no, they're actually serious. Like he's actually infusing. Yeah, he's with doing them. this. <laughs> it, I was blowing it. This blew my mind. And I hope that, I hope this doesn't become a trend where people are just, you know, putting their blood into literal things. I'm like, this is like, a terrible idea guys so please stop doing this yeah it's far from sanitary so i i hope it doesn't explode uh <laughs> explode <laughs> oh geez i i hope this doesn't go anywhere i hope this real i hope this trend just dies here but you know knowing this knowing the world at this point it's going to be like the freaking milk crate challenge where people are climbing up these oh things and, man talk about that stupid oh my god yeah that's it's putting people in the hospital yeah, oh, I mean, I've been see. I saw some clips where like one dude fell out and literally face planted one of the crates. I'm like, oh my god. Yeah, I mean, people are doing it on concrete too. I mean, I, I watched one lady fall off and break her neck. So, yeah. Now, for the sake of uh, now, for the sake of you know pure science, I think I think one of us needs to try it just to you know show how to properly do it. And my now, fingers up my nose already. <laughs> listen, 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 <laughs> listen. You know, totally not for our own enjoyment. Totally not for own enjoyment. No. Just for just for just for research purposes, we for have science. To, we yeah, for science, we have to we have to just we have to just show people, you know, there's a technique to it. You know, these these people are like standing on top of the crates, and it's like, dude, of course, like it's gonna lose balance. You gotta go one foot. You gotta go, you can't keep two feet on the same thing. You gotta keep going. Yeah, and, you can't be pensive either. You gotta no. you gotta just make that next move and just go for it. You just gotta go. You just gotta keep on going. I'm like. Oh my god! It, well, Brian, I wish you luck with that, and I can't wait to see the results. I yeah, I, I can't even do it. <laughs> no, nah, I can't. But uh, the final thing I want to cover tonight is, uh, you know, Max Kellerman is reportedly leaving First Take. This was something that broke a while ago, and uh, you know, I don't know how you feel about this. How do you feel? I mean, in my opinion, I think it really sucks because. I think Stephen Stephen A really just wants to dominate the show and make it his show. And mm. I think for as awful as some of Max Kellerman's takes were, like let's put it in perspective, he was playing that character to battle Stephen A's point yeah. every day. And you know what? I think he played it to the t- to the T. I think he did really well every day. I mean, he he was nothing but professional, and he he was a good talking head. Um, and, and this is nothing against Stephen A. I mean, I, I really enjoy him, but I, I think he's, I think they're really going to, they, they started to take away from that, like debate style as they started including like more guests and there, and now you got like four people and now it's like, I, I mean, ESPN is just going in the direction of let's see how many talking heads we can shove onto the screen at once. And then and hope something works. Exactly. And hope somebody says something ridiculous where you get, you get Kellerman, Stephen A and you know Molly moderating and you you, you do something good you know uh, you you'll get gold out of it you know you get a, you get to take like Iguodala which I don't know how he can go out there and still believe it I again I think he's playing that character but yeah I, think, I know I, I think it I think probably in the meeting room that I think they probably just draw straws of saying like oh uh, St- Stephen A is gonna get the logical take again Max sorry you're gonna have to make a fool of yourself today and he's like god damn it again but you know what? I think he did a good job of it every time. So it sucks to see him go. Uh, and I, I don't think I'll be tuning into the uh, the new show he'll be doing with Jay Williams. And I, I forget who was the third because it doesn't seem at all as interesting as first take. But uh, yeah. I mean, I, you know, I'll say it since, you know, Max Kellerman did the, you know, did the best job he could since Skip Bayless left. While I, you know, disagree with a lot of his takes, especially against the Brady Cliff thing. And while I thought he was ridiculous, I think for what he provided to the show was, you know, it's a, it's entertainment and it's supposed to be entertainment. And he did his job in that, in that aspect. And, you know, while I, while I think that, you know, the, while I don't think the banter between Bayless and, and Stephen A will ever be matched, you know, Kellerman did his, Kellerman did his uh, due diligence, did his job. Yeah, and I think you know he's been there for what four or five years now. Something I think like that. Yeah, I, they were in a good groove. I mean, they were still 
the arguably the best show on ESPN. I mean, you yeah. really, I think they've surpassed Sports Center in popularity. I think if I you're imagine. watching, if you're watching ESPN, you're watching it for first taking Stephen A. Smith. So it just yeah. kind of it kind of sucks to see him go in a different direction. I hope they do keep like the debate style format and they bring another, you know. And and not some guy who will just lie down and take it from Stephen A. He'll fight back. But uh, I agree. We'll see what happens. Yeah, I we will have to see what happens. But Tyler, thank you so much for coming on, man. It's been a great time. Obviously, we're we're we were glad to have you back on for the first time. And it's been it's been a minute. I think it's been uh since we were back at school since uh since we had you on. So obviously glad to have you back on. Hope to get you back on more this semester as we transition back into the fall. But unfortunately, we are now down to the wire, which means that we're going to do a quick little wrap through of what we talked about today. Uh, obviously, you know, welcome back. Welcome back, Tyler, to the show. Tyler, again, great to have you, man. Always a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Uh, and, you know, on today's episode, we talked about Cam Newton missing time after a COVID misunderstanding, as well as as well as uh, Sony Michelle being traded to the L.A. Rams and Jameis Winston's breakup performance in the preseason and NBA news. We talked about the drama, you know, still ongoing between Kevin Garnett and Ray Allen as with him cropping him out of an Instagram post, as well as KG's scheduled Jersey retirement being for March 13th, which ironically is the day that the world shut down. But, uh, you know, two years to the day, let's celebrate it, you know, with a KG Jersey retirement. I'm all for it. And in pop culture, we ended we ended with three strong topics, technically four, because we talked about the milk crate challenge. But we also talked about uh, we talked about Donda and when it will officially ever when, you know, if it will ever drop, frankly, uh, we talked about Tony Hawk releasing a line of skateboards with his blood infused into it, as well as uh, Max Kellerman reportedly leaving first take at some point in the future. Uh, again, great show. Glad to have you on again, Tyler. But from down the wire, I'm Brian Costa. I'm Tyler Tucker. And we'll see you guys next time. Take care.